Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are now here with Simon. So you will be talking to us why you may not need JavaScript. And before we start, I want to remember you that you can always ask your questions on YouTube channel or join the discussion on our Slack channel. Uh, and I will be very happy to pass your questions to Simon. So Simon, if you can now introduce yourself and start your session, you, that will be amazing. Thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, thank you, Samuel. Um, welcome to my talk about uh, why you may not need JavaScript. I'm Simon Martinelli from a company called 72 Services. Um, I started my IT career already a long time ago in 1995. I moved in year 2000 uh, to the Java space and I'm an active member of the Java community. I'm expert group member of uh, Java Batch and Money and Currency. I'm also an active member of the Java user group in Switzerland. And I'm teaching at the university for uh, now uh, around 14 years. You can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is simas underscore ch. Um, you can also contact me there if you like to know uh, something. Today, I like to talk about uh, my current project. I'm working for customers in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, here we also have the code samples. If you're interested in the code, you can go to github.com 72 services and then the project is Vadin Druk Demo. And you can find every code that I was I will talk about in the next um, 45 minutes. I will first show you uh, what I'm currently working on. It's a project for a customer in Switzerland. They provide or they sell a ERP system uh, where small to medium businesses uh, manage their products, their customers. They also have online shop uh, on top of it, mobile devices, etc. But the backend system and the system that the user uh, usually uses to uh, edit the data like the customers or the products is currently what you can see here on the left hand side. It's a uh, application that is uh, written in Oracle Forms. Oracle Forms is a technology that generates in that case a Java client that is downloaded uh, via web start and interacts with, uh, with the database. And uh, because this uh, UI technology is no longer modern, they were looking for a replacement um, of this ERP client. And first they were looking at some low code, no code, uh, rapid application development tools, however you name it, um, to help them to generate most of the UI and don't uh, have the need to replace each screen um, um, like uh, they, must do if they choose a new technology. But the problem was that, uh, as you can uh, imagine, such a rapid application or no code environment is usually just an 80 20 solution. So you can solve around 80% uh, with this tool, but there are remaining 20% with special cases, uh, and this will take a lot of time to implement. And uh, they struggled. Uh, during uh, proof of concept with this uh, rapid application tool. And they asked me if I can help them. And when I came in, in the project, I had a look at the rapid, rapid application development tool. And uh, what I saw is that this rapid application development tool did something similar like Oracle Forms. It generated either a Swing or a, a Vadin web client. But what they really want is a web application. As you can see here, that's the current state of the application on the right-hand side. So it's a, a browser-based web application. And um, I had a look at what they need to do. And uh, we came to the conclusion that we may be able uh, to generate a lot of, co of the, the UI uh, from uh, database structures and some metadata in the data. So some numbers about the current system. The ERP system is based on Oracle Forms, as I already said. It has around 800 forms. That means it has, has around 800 <coughs> screens. They have uh, close to 2,000 tables and views, um, 4,600 procedures and functions. These procedures and functions are the business 
code. So the business code is currently in the database and will stay in the database <clears throat> because they also have uh, other parts of the application that uh, is using the, the Oracle database. Oracle database provides uh, ORDS, Oracle REST data services. So it can uh, define REST APIs based on procedures, functions, or uh, simple select statements, if you like to. So they have other applications that are integrated with that. They have mobile clients that integrate with the database. So the, the business logic has to stay in the database. The main problem about the, the application is because it's a product, the, the customer that buys the product can customize the application. So they can uh, say, okay, we want to remove some uh, input fields or we want to add new input fields, rearrange the screens, um, et cetera. That's um, some of the requirements that they had. And so we had to build a modern web from then that's the goal. The goal is more or less driven by marketing because current users are happy with the old application usually. But um, if you want to sell the product, you can't go to a, to a conference or, or to an exhibition with the old client. So what we also had to build uh, to make this configurable, we had to build kind of a UI editor. So that's what uh, you see here. Here in, on top, uh, you see a module. A module is a part of a system. For example, the M300 that you see here is uh, the order management system. And then the whole UI structure is here in the grid or in the tree grid. So it's a, a, it's a tree based view here on this side and you have kind of a um, property editor where you can edit more or less everything um, that's related to this field here. So for example, this is a key text field where a user can select from, from data. We have checkboxes, text fields, all the necessary UI components that you may imagine. So we have to build uh, this UI editor. And what we really want to do is uh, have something like that. So the user access is the module. That's when where every, and everything starts. And then we have built a, our own framework based on Wadin um, that uh, looks up the database, looks up uh, the database structure, and also this data that was edited with the UI editor, and then builds the UI uh, during runtime. So we can also mix in some uh, security cons uh, constraints. So for example, if a user is not allowed to see all the data, some of the fields are uh, hidden from the user or the user is only allowed to see the data and cannot edit. This is all done here during that generate UI phase. And so we have fulfilled uh, this um, requirement to do. And now I like to show you how we did that. First, some words about UI models. There are different types of UI models. So what we usually have today is the lower um, concept. So we have this so-called single page application that is usually built with React, Angular, Vue, or Wadin, because Wadin is also kind of a single page application framework. And there you have usually an initial request and all subsequent calls are done via Ajax. So you have a call to the server, REST API, uh, usually that uh, returns JSON or you send JSON data from the client. Um, on the other hand, we have the server-side running model where Java Surface, Spring, MVC, the Timely for any other um, rendering component is used. So this is um, one possibility. So we go for the single page application here on the bottom. But if you talk about single page application, we have to also talk about state. So where is the state of the application? There are two uh, possibilities as well. So you could have a session scope um, or you could have um, a server state like here in the, in the top uh, image. And uh, so the client uh, does not have any state usually. But with client sites, JavaScript or TypeScript frameworks like uh, Vue React, you have the state in the client. So the server becomes stateless. That's uh, an advantage because you can scale the server and the client will keep the state. So you don't have any 
um, requirement to uh, synchronize any state on the server. We could also have a request scope in the traditional page lifecycle with the server side rendering. Then you will have to post the whole state from the client to the server. But uh, I will talk about Vadin, and Vadin uh, is a bit special in that case. Vadin has two models. One is a TypeScript programming model. I will not talk about that today. And the other one is called Vadin Flow. That's the original um, Java-based Vadin programming model. And there you have uh, um, more or less a one-to-one -one copy from the UI state uh, from the client on the server as well. So you will get server state. Now, service state, as I said before, may be a problem because uh, you want to scale your backend. This is uh, sometimes true if you have a lot of users and a lot of requests. But we are talking here about an ERP system. And an ERP system is uh, like something else because you usually have only a few users, but a lot of uh, data, so a lot of database tables, as we've seen before, a lot of modules and a lot of, a lot of uh, business code, but you don't have a lot of users at the same time. So you may not need to scale horizontally. So you may not have a problem with the session state. Or if you scale horizontally, you can use sticky session and try to, to route uh, the requests always to the same server for the users so they will not lose their state. So that's the state model. Now let's talk about Vadin. Vadin is already around for many years. So we have uh, one of the first versions is more or less 20 years ago, but uh, Vadin became popular uh, around uh, 2009 when Vadin used uh, GWT. GWT is, called, is a Google Web Toolkit. It still exists, but it's no longer maintained by Google. And uh, the idea of Google Web Toolkit in these days was to generate JavaScript code from Java code. So that's the, uh, the intention of uh, GWT. But Vadim moved away from GWT. So in the year 2017, they did, decided to go for a new upcoming um, way of building web applications that's called Web Components. So Web Components are there to enhance uh, HTML with its own tags and you can um, use uh, some frameworks like uh, Polymer, for example, or LitElement to um, use this web component stuff. But the real change came when we started with our project in 2019 with Vadin 10. Uh, then Vadin introduced a complete new framework, so a rewrite of the existing GWT and web component based framework called Vadin Flow. And uh, Vadin Flow um, has some um, special um, features. So first of all, it, everything that Vadin uses is a web component. So you can use this so-called Vadin components also in other applications without Vadin. Um, so if you're using web components, uh, you can have a look at the Vadin components. And if you like them, you can use that. You don't need to have um, these components. But what Vadin does with Vadin flow, uh, it uh, encapsulate the web components and uh, creates a Java representation of the web component. So you can have a fully Java-based server-side programming model and don't need to write any JavaScript or TypeScript code on the client. That's the idea of Vadin Flow. And that's the reason why we have chosen uh, Vadin because we have, or my customer has um, Java developers um, and uh, we want to uh, reuse uh, the knowledge. And that's why we choose Vadin, that one uh, way, uh, one um, point. And the other point is these Vadin components are very mature. So you have a lot of good components. We will see them. You have a grid, for example, that's uh, superior. And you can use that uh, right away in such data centric applications. Then later on in the past, a few months uh, happened something with uh, Vadin because in Vadin 15, they introduced a second line of Vadin uh, that's called Vadin Fusion. And it's based on, on TypeScript and lit element. So you can write uh, your application with the Vadin components in TypeScript. 
and but you will not need to write any REST APIs because uh, also what Infusions uses the same um, communication infrastructure as what Inflow does that we will see. Currently, Vadin is uh, version 20. Uh, the timeline didn't fit on my screen. That's why I stopped with Vadin 16 here. So to repeat again, Vadin Flow is a TypeSafe Java UI component API. So you are server-side, you do server-side development, you can write your application in Java. It remains a bit, uh, it reminds a bit of, uh, of Swing development. We will see that. It fully uses web components. You can use the web components from Vadin, but you can also use third-party web components made for Vadin from the community, or you can integrate web components that you find anywhere in the internet and wrap them or um, make them able to use in, in the Java UI. Uh, one thing that's uh, important for the productivity, you don't need the REST API because the communication from client to server is fully transparent inside Vadin, you don't need to care about that. So you can directly access your service or repository from the UI uh, view um, to the service or repository in, in, Swing, in Spring, for example. Uh, you have a bi-directional data mapping. That means if you, the usage changes something on the client, this will reflect the state on the server. And if you change the server state, it will be reflected on the client. So you have a bi-directional uh, mapping between client and server. So let's have a look at the architecture. Uh, if we start on the bottom, we have the backend. So we have business logic and persistence or so services or repositories. Currently, um, the used framework for building Vadin application is Spring Boot, but they are currently working on Quarkos integration. So you may uh, want to, uh, you can choose from, from the, the frameworks. So Vadin is currently uh, Spring-based, but you, Vadin works also in an application server, so it uses CDI integration. You can use it in Jakarta, Java E applications. You can also use Vadin. We are using Spring Boot uh, because this is the default uh, if you uh, create a Spring Boot application. So you have this business logic and persistence, for example, in Spring. And then the user interface code will, writ will be written in Java with Vadin. You have these components uh, on one hand side that you can use. And on the other hand, you have temp, uh, HTML templates that you can use to, to create uh, the look and feel. And uh, we also have uh, a seeming integrated. So uh, you can also have a dynamic seeming. So for example, we are building a product for customers and these customers may want to adapt their ERP system product they, uh, to their uh, look and feel. So they can change uh, the look and feel, or we do the, the theming for them. So each customer may have its own on theme and the end. And then uh, on the browser side, we have the web components, the templates and the themes. And this will uh, have this bi-directional communication between the browser and the server, uh, but you, you will not see anything of that usually. For sure, you can execute JavaScript, on the server that will then be uh, communicated to the client and the JavaScript will be executed on the client and the result will again sent back to the server. That's all possible. And if you look at this picture here, uh, the other part of Vadin uh, that I was uh, talking about was Vadin Fusion. In that case, you will write your whole UI code on the browser side in TypeScript but we'll have the same communication mechanism here it's between the browser and the server as we have with Vadin Flow. So how to start? Uh, you can start with uh, local development, for example. So you can uh, go here to startvadin.com. Uh, it's uh, similar to uh, what you get if you uh, use a Spring Starter or something like that, you can here add some additional uh, views, for example, uh, like a master detail view, and it will immediately uh, generate some data. And if you're finished with that, you can download the application and then go ahead and, and work on the, uh, on the application. That's very handy and very helpful uh, because you can uh, do everything. You also see that uh, you can have a look at uh, the other 
uh, models, for example, if you have a smaller device or a, a tablet or a, um, a mobile phone, um, this is all possible and all the components are also responsive. So this is not a problem. You can also have uh, the whole thing from left, uh, right to left, uh, depending on, on the direction of how you write. There is another way you can use Gitbot. Gitbot is an online editor where you can immediately start to code. You don't need to download the project and uh, don't need the local and uh, development environment, for example. So that's easy to start. But now let's have a look at some code. Um, this is the most simple pro um, view that we could create. That's a Hello World uh, example. When we start um, at the top, we see here an annotation route. Route means we have um, a Vadin component or Vadin class that uh, is bound to a URL. For example, here we have a hello view. We didn't specify name of the route. So um, by default, it will take everything that's before view because view is the suffix. Um, the default suffix, so the route will be hello. Then we extend from a vertical layout. Vertical layout is just a um, in internal layout. Uh, everything will be like you see here from top to bottom, uh, like on a stack. And then we have uh, the code where we uh, create a new text field. We add a new label. We create a button, a button with the text and a click listener here. That's the Lambda expression. And so if somebody uh, clicks on the button, we will uh, say uh, hello. And then we can add text field table and button and this will then uh, be on, on the screen. That's it. So it's very easy at the end. Uh, and we can have a look at this in the browser. I hope my application runs. And uh, so let's see. So it's the wrong one. We see our application and uh, that's our hello uh, view here. You can see in the address bar, it rendered hello. And here we can uh, write whatever we want and uh, do the greeting. So that's just uh, not so impressive, but what's interesting is that we wrote our code just in Java. So that's again, uh, the class here, we have an additional annotation page title where we can define the page title. You can also have a dynamic page title if you want to uh, translate it. If you have an application that must be translatable, um, that's it. But the interesting part is if I go to the developer tools and now I have to um, bring this down here. And now we look at the requests. So first of all, we go to hello. If you go to hello, then we can see here that uh, it downloads something. First of all, it uh, downloads uh, sv.js, that is server work for a progressive web application. I will talk about that later on. But uh, what we have to have a look at is uh, the content. So maybe I can uh, see here the response. And this response here looks like JSON and a bit, uh, a bit uh, HTML. So we have a body here. So this is like with every single page application, that's the shell page that is downloaded first. And now uh, let's have a look at uh, what happened if we type some text here, then we see there's a request. And if we go down here, to the request, we see some data that happened here. And now if I hit greet, I get another of these requests. And um, here also we see uh, some changes. Um, so that's also some JSON lookalike data. And if you go here to the response, we will find uh, changes and here we will see anywhere here, we will see some, maybe the data that I entered here in this node, we see hello chain nation and that's the text that is rendered here. 
So as you can see, even if I type, then it will generate the change events that are then sent to the server. And if I hit the button, I send an event to the server and the response will be the changes that has to be applied to the current view. So that's the magic of, uh, of Vadin, how it works internally. Then uh, Vadin introduced something new because if you know Vadin from previous versions, uh, Vadin wasn't uh, aware of that it's a web application. That changed a bit. You still program in Java, but uh, Vadin embraces also uh, web concepts. That means um, we could have uh, a routing with uh, query parameters and path variables, for example. So we could have like a uh, implement uh, an interface that that's, um, name has URL parameter, you define the, the, the name, for example, string, and here you get uh, the parameter, and uh, then you get uh, directly, for example, here we have us 450, and then we could have slash one, and you get the one here in this parameter. And here you see that there's a location, or in, on the before event here, we have a location object and location location object has the query parameter, so we can also pass uh, query parameters to it. Um, here is no um, route template or something like that. You can have like um, wildcard uh, syntax to define the, the, how the URL will, will look like. Then if we look at uh, data-centric applications like our ERP system, there is one component that is very important. And uh, this component is a grid. Um, grid is uh, to display data. So we have this here as well. Go back, we have here employees, for example. And here we have this grid where we can select, we can edit or we can add employees on, on a dialog, for example, or we can filter data directly. And what I'm doing here, displaying, filtering, sorting, that's everything's out of the box in Vadin. So we, this grid component here uh, that I have here um, uh, defines a type. So that's a custom record and I have various ways to add columns here. For example, I uh, add the columns by the set column method and add the attribute names of this custom record. And this will auto create columns that will be sortable. Or I can also render, um, for example, components. So maybe we look here. Um, here we have uh, different uh, configurations. We could have a multi-sort, we can have column reordering out of the box, so I can move this here around. Uh, this is also possible to, to get access to this event from the reordering, then you can store that and the user always have the same order of his um, grid columns. And here we see how I add an, a column uh, with passing a reference to the get method of the ID, the name, the department name. And here I can render also a, a button, for example, in a column that I can use. I can set columns frozen. That's everything that I can do. But that's not the interesting part. The more interesting part starts here. Um, this code, by the way, is from Vadin 14. In Vadin zip, uh, I use Vadin 14 because it's the last LTS version, the long-term support version. Um, but if you use the most recent, that's currently 20, then you this code may look a bit different. But anyway, I decided to use one in 14 uh, so I can uh, explain the concept of data providers. So every component like grid, the tree grid, the combo box, a list, or a, or a select element, for example, has a data provider. And the data provider here is callback data provider. That means it's a lazy loaded data provider because if we have a grid like this, uh, we don't want to load the data at once. We just want to load the data when the user scrolls, otherwise it doesn't make sense uh, to load the data. This will uh, consume a lot of memory and take a while because you have to load the data from the database. So it's better to have it lazy. And this is out of the box supported by Vadin. You can create a callback data provider like here, 
And this callback data provider has three parameters, and uh, usually only two. The third one I will explain later what is for. But the first two, uh, the first is called fetch callback. Um, that's where the data is loaded. And the second one is a count callback. So what in calls first the count callback to get the, uh, the information how many uh, records are there um, that it can use to, to display uh, the grid and also to make the uh, scroll bar here look uh, nice because it if, if it doesn't know how many elements are there, if you scroll down, um, maybe the scroll bar will not behave nicely, but if you provide the number of total records, it can uh, display this uh, in a nice form. So we have the count and the fetch. Now what's interesting is uh, we also have uh, paging and paging comes with this query. So we have a query object here and this is a login query. Uh, and this query has an offset, a limit, sort orders, and a filter. In newer version, it also has a page and a page size because you want to directly use the information with, for example, a Spring Data JPA repository, and then you can create a page request out of the page and the page size. If you just get offset and limit, you have to re uh, recalculate page and page size. In my case, it doesn't matter because I'm using SQL directly and there I can use offset and limit. I will show you later on what this code, where this code comes from. It looks like SQL, but it's Java. So uh, stay tuned. I will uh, explain that to you as well. And what we also get here is the filter. And we can use this filter directly to build our where condition. So we get the filter or else we create a no condition filter is here a condition and that's a choke type um, that's uh, like a predicate that we can pass and so we create offset and limit we can also create order by because we get uh, from the query we get the order fields so sorry we get the order fields and um, we can um, change this sort order here in the sort order element we have uh, uh, the column uh, that is sorted by and sort direction is ascending or descending. And so we can use that directly to build, in this case, the SQL statement and display the data. So in this uh, tiny example, we even didn't have, don't have a repository. We directly access the database from the view. That depends if this is a good idea or not. I did it for, because uh, it's more simple to show you but maybe here it would be a good place to, to add a repository <clears throat> that you can also test. And this filter, where does the filter come from? Um, we have the filter text field. And uh, as you have seen, I can type here. And uh, when I type with filters, and uh, this is done by a value change listener here on the text field and then I can call on the data provider set filter method and pass a condition. And the condition is again, something from, from joke that I use. If I don't have condition, I clear the filter. So I don't have any filter anymore. That's the way uh, this works. So the grid is really powerful and very helpful. So if you have to build this uh, CRUD, like great read, update and delete application types, you will gain a lot of time because everything that you may need is already there. The other thing that you also need uh, is our forms. So if you have look uh, here, we have uh, like this edit dialog. This could also be part of the screen. I decided to use a dialog, it doesn't really matter. And here we have various uh, types of, for example, we have a date picker or we have a uh, select. Uh, box where we can uh, choose something. Um, this is all uh, also done by uh, Java modding components. So we can have a look at this dialog here. We have uh, a form layout. There are different types of layout. Form layout is the one that um, creates a label beside uh, or on top, depending on the configuration of the form. And then we have uh, something called a binder. A binder is there to bind uh, the data to the input fields. 
And uh, here we see that I create a text field, then I can create a bind for this field. I say the field is ID and it binds to get uh, ID from the employee record. The setter is null that will then render, as you can see here, a read-only uh, text field. Or we have here the name, there we can define that it's required. So if I create a new employee and don't uh, enter anything here, then it uh, has this required uh, indication. Or we can have um, a validator. Again, if I enter data and just uh, enter one uh, character, then it uh, may render this. By the way, this is not a good example uh, because there are uh, names that have less than three characters, by the way, but it's just uh, for for the demo here. And here we have the getter and setter, so it's a read-write field. We can have a date picker, we can have a select element, whatever. And here we see that we also can use set items to have a eager loaded list. For example, the departments are fetched all at once because we only have two, so it uh, doesn't have to be lazy. So we set directly um, the departments. And then we have a button, for example, and the button then will uh, open the dialog. And in this dialog, we also have at the end the save button that will use a transaction to save the data to the database. That's more or less uh, the whole magic of, uh, of this. Here again, uh, I forgot before, it, we see that uh, the parameter stuff, how to get uh, the query parameters, and then you can do whatever you like to uh, with this. Vadin has a lot of these has interfaces. So these are interfaces that um, are used to uh, declare uh, what the component is able to do. So we have uh, SURL as error as dynamic title, for example. These are these interfaces that you have here. If you look at the components, there are many more. So you have uh, has component, is focusable, has text, has theme, has value, whatever. You can use them uh, to check what kind of element uh, you received, for example, in your, in your method. So this is the form. You have validation, you have converter, uh, you have everything you need at the end. Uh, to build a form. Now, sometimes uh, you want to do something in the background. For example, uh, in our application, the user can export uh, the data that is displayed in the grid directly in an Excel file. And uh, depending on the size of the grid, this may take a few seconds. So it's not a good idea to do this synchronous. So we can do that asynchronous. But the question is, if we do something asynchronous, how do we notify the customer? or the user. Um, this is very easy with uh, Vadin as well. You can use a push notification. Vadin uses Atmosphere. That's a push framework that uses um, web sockets, but also can fall back um, to long polling, for example, if uh, web sockets are not available. And uh, what you can see here, this is, a, is an example to, to, uh, to display uh, um, a message after a while. So it sleeps for five seconds and then it displays hello world or hello from thread. This code is also available here. So we can have a look at it right in the code. Uh, this is this notification view. And uh, what's important to say here is um, this line of code here. If you remember Swing or AWT programming or Eclipse RCP with SWT, then you know that there is a UI thread and you only can access the UI in the UI thread. So if you do like uh, threading, you have to get UI thread to display something. In Vadin, it's similar, it's not the thread, but the UI that you need, there's a UI object and you have to call UI access on this element and then you can notify uh, the user, otherwise it will not work. That's uh, one thing to remember, but you really can push. And this is very handy because we can then display a progress bar and say the Excel file is generating in the background. And uh, once it's finished, um, we will get back to it. 
Vadin also has a test support with test benches based on Selenium and web drivers. Um, it's only available in the commercial version, by the way. Vadin has a dual licensing model. So if you're using just the, the open source part of Vadin, then you can use it uh, for free. If you want to use some of the special uh, commercial components or uh, this test bench, then you can, can uh, then you have to pay for it. Because Selenium as a test framework does not support web components at the moment, um, that's the problem. Uh, there are other uh, web uh, test frameworks that you can use for sure, because you, as long as it supports web components, then it's not a problem. I was talking about uh, PVA. PVA support is also there for Vadin. You have this uh, web manifest and service worker, and we've seen this SV.js that uh, by the way, you can customize that uh, and do then some um, stuff in the background or in offline mode. But just, we also see here uh, that there comes a button install and I, I can install this application and I have a shortcut on the, on the desk, for example. That comes out of the box if I use PVA in Vadin. Now in the last few minutes, I like to talk about Chook. Uh, Chook means Java Object Oriented Querying, and we are using that because we have a lot of data, we have a lot of procedures and functions, and it's a pain to use that with JPA or JDBC directly. And Chook is not an OR mapper like Hibernate, it's more a generator and a SQL type safe Java API. So if you want to use Chook, you can define a generator. For example, here we have a DDL based uh, Chook. Generator, it generates the data based on flyway migrations, but you can use here MySQL, Oracle, whatever database you like to. And it generates data classes or a meta model from the database that you can use to write type safe SQL. So for every table, for every function procedure in the table, for every column, it generates uh, such a constant that you can use later on. And then it looks like that. You have this DSL context, that's the Chook uh, SQL API. And then you can write insert in two columns, values, execute. You can write select from or com more complicated select with join. And uh, you no longer have to deal with strings in, in Java. Even if you have uh, with Java 16 now the text blocks, this here is time is a compiled time checked in contrast to everything that you do uh, in in uh, in Java and strings. Um, Chook also generates uh, like an updatable record for every database that has a primary key, and you can use it to store and delete it. It's that's maybe a part that uh, could be described as or mapping in in its form. And uh, if you're using Vadin and Chook, uh, there's a little addition that I've wrote. It's no longer, uh, uh, it's, it's supported, but it's not on the newest Vadin version. I have to update that. But then it's very easy to use uh, Vadin directly. And uh, you all already seen some code here in the employees view. That's where uh, Chook is used. And you see here, this code here, that's a uh, SQL statement to get the data. And this is, as I said, type safe because it's checked against um, the database. And if I change something, because I can do that, well, let's have a look. Let's stop the application. And uh, we have here the DB migration with the create tables, for example. And if I go here and say, okay, we have not the name, we have a first name and the last name like that. And then I uh, create that with, uh, with Maven because it's a Maven-based uh, application here. I do compile. Then it regenerates uh, the Chook uh, code from the database, as you can see here. And uh, then we have, oh, I have a problem, sorry. What did I run first name, last name? Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot show you, but what will happen if the demo would work, uh, the code will no longer compile because we're using here the employee name 
for example, and the employee name is no longer name, it's first name and last name. And that's the magic of Chook. I highly recommend if you're using SQL currently in, in uh, Java or also Hibernate, uh, have a look at it. It's, uh, it's worse to look at it. You can combine Chook and uh, Hibernate as well because you can uh, define the SQL statements or the, all the queries uh, in this uh, Chook DSL with the type safe um, classes generated by Chook. But uh, as a result, you can also have entities and then manipulate the entities and save the entities if you prefer this way. For us, uh, as I said, Hibernate was not an option because we have close to 2000 tables and we had to create 2000 entities and that's not feasible. So we, we went with uh, Chook. So to conclude, um, if you're a Java developer, life is much easier with Wadi. You can create this data-centric type of applications like I show you uh, very easy and it, uh, it feels more natural. Because in the background, if you do a, a build with uh, Wadin, it will also use NPM, for example, and uh, the web components and generate JavaScript code and stuff like that. But you don't touch it, you don't have to touch it. And you just know your Java code and Maven build tool and the rest is all managed by Wadin. And that's very, uh, very handy and uh, speeds up your development time. And on the other hand, Chook, uh, it's not a real introduction to Chook, just to give you an idea what Chook is, is also great stuff because it's uh, type safe SQL for Java. So you can use um, SQL, but you don't have to deal with strings in Java code. And Vadi and Chook fit very good together with the data provider and uh, the fetch and count callback that you can write in, in SQL with. Uh, Chook, that's a great addition. But sometimes um, you have to control the client side, you have to write some JavaScript code. We, even I did uh, had to write some JavaScript code in the, in the application. But there is where what Infusion comes in. And if you really need to uh, program on the client side, uh, if you have to access client side API, stuff like that, you have to may have a look at what Infusion because you can mix what Infusion and uh, one in flow. So you have both of both worlds, worlds are the best of both worlds, but you don't need to write REST APIs. That's a great um, uh, thing because you don't have to test the REST API. You can test your, your backend system and don't have to worry about the interface. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, are any questions? Thank you very much, Simon. <clears throat> uh, yeah, please, everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them on uh, the YouTube channel or on Slack. At the moment, we don't have any questions. Let's wait for a couple of minutes before we, we, close, we close it down. I, I was not aware that Vadin was, was started so long ago, 2001, right? Yeah, but the first versions were not, uh, I don't know who used this framework in, in the first versions because it was just a layer on top of HTML to write Java code, but it, I can't even remember what it used. But uh, the point is that uh, in my opinion, Vadin with this JWT stack was a bit a niche, but now they did great progress with Vadin Flow for Java developers and even great progress with Vadin Fusion for people that want to use TypeScript on the client. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think web components and that's the base of both Flow and Fusion is the future because you can exchange them, you can build your own web components and reuse them in your applications. And in fact, you're only using lit element with what infusion. So it feels like you're using lit element pure, but you're mm -hmm. using the what infusion um, components or the what in web components and the fusion communication infrastructure. So you don't have to 
um, write the REST API. You just can annotate the Java class on the backend. Uh, and then Vadin will generate the TypeScript access code for uh, this endpoint on the server. So it makes life easier because usually um, if you're a kind of a full stack developer, so if you split your team and you have really front end and back end developers and they are separated, maybe it's not uh, the best framework, but if you have smaller teams with full stack developers, Vadin can boost your, uh, your uh, development performance uh, because you have to write less code. Yeah. Actually, uh, what uh, we are seeing at, at least in the scene that is near me is the first option. A lot of companies are uh, specializing the team in either backend or frontend. So they have people specialized on that area. So maybe for those companies, it doesn't make sense to, to, to use Vadin, but in companies that most of the people are still are Java developers, that may be a good fit at, uh, at this moment. Yeah. That, uh, for me, the best thing is that I don't have to deal with uh, the JavaScript build stack. Yeah, a lot of people that go, that work with Java uh, prefer not to touch that part. Yeah, not 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 to speak about CSS because that's even worse for for them. <laughs> yeah, the styling the styling part is is done pretty well uh, in in Vadin because we have uh, two themes out of the box. One is Lumo. That's the default theme, yeah. and the other is a material theme. And you, it's very easy to, there are some CSS variables that you can change with the colors, and then you're done. Yeah, and without, you, without having to move a pixel up, a pixel down, right? It, exactly. Yourself. <laughs> but that, okay. I, yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. I was saying that uh, we don't have any questions. So if, um, if, someone wants to ask Simon a question, please do so on Slack. And Simon, if you can join the discussion on yeah, Slack, sure. we will appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, Simon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.